Hello and welcome to the England Rugby Podcast with O2 Inside Line. I'm Dylan Hartley and this week I'm joined by Vicky Fleetwood and Sarah McKenna. Vicky, Sarah, thank you for joining me. The first game of the Six Nations is done. Uh, great result for you guys. Bonus point win. How was it being back out there? Yeah, it was It was awesome. I think we've been training for like so long for that for that moment to finally be together like in a white shirt like and the, the training we've been doing has been like next level stuff that we've never experienced before so I think we were all just waiting for that moment like where we could put that into practice and see like where that how far that's got us so the fact um, that we've just been going so like hard in on each other for like weeks and weeks and weeks now um, it was just it was just great to see like us actually getting to like perform that on on our opposition rather than ourselves and see where we're at because I think a lot of this the Six Nations for us is about, you know, find out where we are, like find out where we need to go to. I think we did that, like we sort of found that out exactly yesterday. Brilliant. Well, and, and Vicky, you know, post-match, you, you've been preparing for the game for so long. What was the overall sort of emotion and, and feeling with, obviously result is exactly what you want, but what about performance? How, how did you guys um, assess that? I think it was actually just a bit flat afterwards. Um, well, that's, because that's disappointing. I trained- yeah, so just because we know that we could have done better, um, there were a couple of tries we left out there, just, you know, last last pass just went to ground and it was just kind of individual errors. Um, and just because we have, like McKenna says, like we've been training so hard that we wanted to go out there and have that perfect performance, which is never going to happen until we get that. I think that like even the coaches as well are just, we're all just a bit like, oh, that could have been better. Um so, yeah, amazing to put so many points on. Obviously, Scotland is such a, a much better team than they they have been and they, they're building year on year. So for us to still get that scoreline is amazing. And I think we still need to look at that and, and actually take some real positives from that. Um, and I think actually just like looking back at it and in the review this morning, um, there were more positives than we kind of thought after the game. You know, just kind of that, that lull straight after. Um, like collectively, I think everyone just hoped that we'd have, have got a little more in there. Brilliant. Um, sorry to pause. I can hear a ringing and I've just realised, I think I've got my wife's phone in my coat and it's right there and it's searched my iPhone. It's going off. I'm just <laughs> yeah, going to chuck it outside. It. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm professional. Right, I'm back. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's my one wrongdoing. I'm bloody hot now. I was sitting there trying to listen to you as well, Vicky. Like, and then there was just going just off cut right my there. Bit. McKenna said all the good stuff. Cut my bit. You said that you've been preparing for the game. You know, you've gone to another level. And I've talked to mids and I talked to Pops and Bots last week about the intensity that you've been training at. You know, I'm, I'm really keen to come in and see your PPP session. It's three Ps, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm keen to come see that. You guys have obviously been around the team for like a decade now. Um, and you've been as... Sorry... <laughs> that's really impressive by the way um but you've seen this environment you know change and you've obviously been sevens players as well so you've been in different environments how open are you guys to change because obviously it's getting harder and and you know when change is hard the change is hard to do right how how have you guys approached that vicky for me especially with the conditioning side of things that's something that i actually really love so like when we're being tested and challenged in that way, like I hope um, that like I thrive in that situation, like that's kind of my bread and butter. So the fact that I moved from hooker to back row um, after going through the seven setup and stuff, and um, that's because I like really worked on, on that side of things and just continuing to like that repeatability um, is something that I want to show on the field. So yeah, it's, it's tough, but at the same time, when, when you finish, like you feel like you've accomplished something. Um, the hardest part has been because obviously I was one of the finishers uh, in yesterday's game um, in training. We've we've been playing with 13 against 15. So we were actually pretty prepared when uh, there was those bins yesterday. We were we were on the side going, we do this week in, week out. We're all ready to go. <laughs> so we were like prepped for it. <laughs> do, do, do you know what? I've, I've actually been reading um, a couple of bits online. Loads of teams are practicing with 14 13 men now because of the, I so the un, unpredictable nature and every every team I played in for some reason they trained with 14 men as well um, I, I spent a lot of time sat in the, the naughty boys seat so 
funnily enough, the team actually played better with me off the field. Um, <laughs> right, let, let, let's go back to 2011. Um, you guys have known each other. Can, can I say 2011 or did you know each other previous? We knew each other before because we played under 20s together. Okay. So. Um, Sarah, have you got first impressions of Vicky? Oh, first impressions of Leo. Um, yeah, like she, she was just like always like giving it all into training, like obviously fitness like, has always been a massive thing for her. So I remember like back in the day when we were like all 16, all the under 20s girls like were all carrying like baby weight, like puppy faces sort of thing. And like Fleet was still like trim and slimline like then. So she was like so professional. She's always been like the ultimate professional within that. Right, Vicky, you're gonna have to say something really kind about- um, No, that's the kind of thing she's ever said about me. <laughs> um, first impressions the other way around I mean she just basically said you're uber professional from 16 years old I definitely wasn't um I I just massively remember like I can just remember all the dunk tackles she used to make and I was just like oh my god because she was in the centers and she'd just get that line speed and just absolutely like especially being like a bit of a smaller player she would just like smash people I just remember, I just remember like always thinking, oh my god, I wish I could hit like that. <laughs> what, what what about so go this goes to 2011, then fast forward a bit. Um, you both get capped. What are, what are your memories can, can, of of your first cap, Sarah? I was just pretty terrified to go on. So I remember at that point in the game, it was like pretty close. So I was like, why why the hell are you bringing me on? Um, like I was pretty confused. I was like, this is this is poor coaching. Like <laughs> picking this at a good time. Milk, so I'm, I'm like don't feel pretty I don't feel very comfortable right now but uh, yeah it was like a bit of a baptism of fire I mean within the context of the tournament we were playing like the game didn't mean a lot but like obviously playing in a white shirt you go out there to win win every game um, but luckily like came through unscathed um, had like uber senior players around like people who had been in the squad for ages so I just felt like a massive like small fish back then so yeah like all about I suppose the experiences every player I've talked to on here and I was one of these players as well men or women everyone I've had on everyone kind of gets there to, to international rugby and they've wanted it for so long but when they get there they're like oh this is different to what I thought it would be am I ready type thing and there's lots of players that tour and are kind of thankful that they never played on that tour and they got to get a taste of it. Did, did you feel a bit like that, Vicky, in terms of when you arrived to play senior women's rugby for, for England? Did you get that kind of imposter syndrome or were you just, were, were you thriving? Were you ripping straight into it? Um, I mean, so I didn't have that sitting on the bench um, scenario because I actually started, but um, I was more worried about the fact that I was rooming with Rocky Clark. <laughs> What, um, tell me about Rocky then. What, <laughs> so on, she's retired now, so you can you can say whatever you want. It's not going to affect you. So obviously, like I'd only ever I hadn't played at club with her or anything like that back then. Um, I'd only ever played against her, and then um, we were, we used to play in the A's, like the kind of the year leading up to when we got capped. So we were always just playing against her, and I just remember like. I just remember thinking, oh my God, she's so fierce. Like, she's pretty scary. So I was like, oh no, um, I've got a room with her. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's like for me. Obviously there was quite an age gap as well. Like she'd got loads of caps, um, proper senior player. Um, I was more worried about that than actually getting on the field. And then as soon as I was rooming with her, she is the softest person in the world. Um, she cries at everything. She's always like got her arm around you, trying to big you up. Like she's the nicest person, like off the field, just on it, just totally different. I've shared a few drinks with uh, with Rocky and Monaco of all places. Um, I don't know how or why or when it was, but we've had a few drinks in Monaco together. It was it was very funny. Um, right, the other thing about you two is is you're quite unique in the fact that you've you've kind of been in both camps in terms of sevens and fifteens can you you know I can't imagine that you know for me playing for England and going back to play club rugby like trying to memorize two sets of line out calls was hard enough but the the there's not even slight nuances it's a completely different game right when you go from sevens to fifteens how have you guys managed that like and, and just tell me about your experience with it Sarah um I suppose sevens like for us always used to be something we'd do in the summer like because back in the day like you could especially even if you're playing for England you might be able to get away and like do a couple of sevens tournaments like social sevens so I think like for me it was always something like I really really enjoyed like a chance just to like let loose and then um, 
and then like obviously it was getting like bigger and bigger and bigger and there's more focus being put on it and I just like end up really enjoying my, my time doing it so um it, it I guess it transformed into like getting a contract and, and being one of the, like the first players to have a sevens contract like full-time sevens contract but I think like we were all learning we were all learning how to play the sport and like what women what women's sevens was like it was sort of uncharted territory to like a degree in the, on that professional sense so I think we were all like teaching each other as much as as much as like you know being taught it from a coach brilliant do you, do you think in terms of your development as a player Vicky do you think it gave you the opportunity to develop your game um like take the shackles off it and just go play yeah absolutely um it definitely developed like my decision making my handling all that kind of stuff um and it's kind of brought me in to be a bit more of that link player between the forwards and the backs um I just think for me like I never got that real opportunity I was kind of moved between um prop and wing in sevens um so I'm quick but I'm not sevens quick and for me, that was like quite daunting to be playing on the wing against like lightning quick people. The only thing I had was that I was probably bigger than them and I could like smack them a little bit. Um, so if they've run around me, like I'm never going to chase them down because they've just got more pace than me. Um, so, yeah, I just don't think that I ever fully really got enough chance to to play enough sevens because of injury, because of like not being selected or whatever um, to really find my feet so much because I kind of the two years that I spent there were, were split um, and I went back to 15s playing in the front row which like you say is so different it's so, so safe it's so <laughs> safe no one's running around you on the wing there are you you're next to a ruck you're, you're in safe safe territory yeah exactly so it's fair to say that you're more at home in the in the 15s game Sarah for, for you where would you prefer to play sevens 15s what, what do you prefer I think, like, for me, like, 100% 15s, I, I, like, enjoy, I suppose, the strategy of playing, like, full 80 minutes and getting to, like, apply different parts of your game plan to, like, an opposition at different points in the match and move between that. But, I obviously, in the short and format, you make a mistake over three minutes and you're done for. And so and there's sort of, like, no coming back from that. So you, you get a couple of moments wrong or you, or you don't make the right decision and, it, and it's cutthroat, isn't it? And, you sort of the game's gone but I just enjoy that back and forth moments like you said earlier like there's ebbs and flows for 15s game where one team's on top and you've got to change that momentum somehow so I just enjoy that strategy element of, of 15s versus versus sevens I, I, I find like 15s is probably like way more closed skill set whereas sevens you're probably a bit more of a rounder player and I'm just thinking for for you know you guys attracting other other girls and, and women to the game do you think sevens is a good place to start potentially I mean any sort of rugby right like just any sort of like get like we say like get down club and play but um I think like it doesn't take many people to create a sevens team I think that's the beauty of it and that's why I guess it's taken off all around the world like countries you wouldn't play 15s but they're they're playing sevens so I think that's the beauty of it isn't it you only seven people and you, and you can sort of have, have real good like a ground with people um but yeah without a doubt I mean a lot of people have put off because everyone just goes on oh it's so fast like you're dead all the time and you run legs off you and I think that really puts people off but actually like you said it's that you got you you know your skills get exploited and if you like want to you do what I mean I like put yourself at the test no better place to do yeah. I think what what loads of people do enjoy about it is that like the social tournaments that you can play in and that's what you really want to be involved in uh when you first start playing because it's so much fun okay let's talk socially you you must have you know sevens taken you um all around the world um well and 15s what's the best place you've played rugby abroad uh, or some of your highlights it you know just r- rattle them off sevens or 15s or both both it's rugby new zealand away in 2017 um was amazing when we were and when we played um before the Lions test. Mate, Road of Vegas, that's my hometown, baby. Road of Vegas. <laughs> the bright lights. It was so good. Um it stunk though. Yeah, it's part of the you know, the experience. <laughs> you get used to it or not? Or when you live in the countryside, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah that was like probably one of my favorite memories. And I was on the bench so <laughs> um to have it as one of your favorite memories and actually be on the bench, I think that says a lot. But uh, are you talking like the experience, like you got the Lions traveling support there, the whole tour, yeah. you're playing in New Zealand where it's religion, they live and breathe it, it's a big All deal. And then the result, okay. So, and yeah. Rotorua being the beautiful place that it is, yeah? 
Yeah, although we did, we end like I said, it stunk, and we ended up stinking on the plane on the way back because we thought, oh, it'd be really good. We'll go to the springs, and we'll like go. <laughs> That was honestly the worst idea we ever had. Even though we obviously showered afterwards, we were like, oh yeah, putting it all on our face. Oh, wow, that's how you get meningen cockle. What's that? It sounds worse than, it's just basically <laughs> bad. You don't want it going in your mouth or your ears. Um, oh, right, we weren't told that. But anyway, <laughs> we, uh, we then had like 24 hour flight on the way home where everyone just stunk of sulfur. It was disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so that's local knowledge, sorry. You didn't get the uh, the brief. Um, what about you, Sarah? Oh, like obviously you can't you can't have this conversation without mentioning Dubai. Um, like whether you go as like a fan or a player, like it's it's next level. It's something else. Um, I don't think you can get an idea of like how extreme it is. Whether it's like the heat or just the size of it. Like all the travelling fans when you're there, it's like home from home, um, playing under like the lights at night, and it's still like 30 degrees is is pretty special. I think that's a, a memory that will probably always stay with anyone who plays there no matter like sort of what tier tournament they're in um but then i think with with the women's seven especially we always went to like smaller locations like the lesser known locations in country so we went to some like pretty like random places we went to brazil we went to sao paulo and that's quite like an unusual tournament and played in a massive massive football stadium like torrential rain come six o'clock and like the like the rain was like beating down but i guess it's just all that stuff that like, you do outside of it all those moments that like you share with each other Vicky, I know that the Olympics was a huge goal of yours. Um, you obviously had a, a background in athletics um, and it's a big part of your upbringing. But um, life kind of had other plans for you on, on the way to Rio. Do you, do you mind talking about how you, your mum passed and you had to make that difficult decision? Yeah, so um, just kind of like leading up to the Olympics, um, I actually, it came at a really good time. I had a stress response in my foot um so at the time my mum had just been um told that like her cancer was um terminal and that she was actually given like weeks not months and at that time I was just like do you know what rather than me being in and around training all the time I'm going to use that time to go home and spend that time with my mum so I missed out on going I, there was like a back-to-back -back tour um but I, I'd been put in a boot anyway so I was like well I'll be training like at SSP with a couple of the girls that have been left behind um like that wasn't the right environment for me to be in um but yeah thankfully like I wasn't away at the time thankfully I was injured and it meant that I could be with my family put my family first because at the end of the day rugby's a game and um there's much more to life and obviously family's so important so I went and I stayed at home and it meant that I could be by my side, by my mum's side, like when she passed away. And actually, you know, I did miss out on a few tournaments, but you know, it was all worth it in the end. And, and because I missed like those two big tournaments, it meant that the team had pretty much been solidified uh, on the back of that. There wasn't really much opportunity to kind of get a foot in um, on the back of, so after my mum passing, me being back in training like a week later or whatever, um, although the girls were like so supportive, they all like wore black like armbands, um, like the day that they'd heard because they were playing on that day and they actually went out and won the tournament, um, which was amazing, like loved watching that. Um, that was uh, that was in Canada. And then um, I think it was Canada. Were you there, McKenna? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of yeah. And then, um, yeah, I was back in training when they all came back and um, we just had like a final shot at, with both me and Sarah. Um, we all went with the team to, um, where was it? In the Alps somewhere in France to play against France. And it was kind of our last opportunity, but kind of they, they kind of knew who they wanted to take and it just wasn't meant to be. But um, you know, I'd always choose kind of not going to the Olympics and being with my mum um, for those final moments. So like, although it was kind of a dream that I kind of set out to achieve when I was doing athletics and, and once I stopped that, thought that it wasn't ever going to come around and, and the opportunity would never arise again. Um, and then having the opportunity again with sevens, I thought, you know what, I really want to go for this. Actually, it just wasn't meant to be for me. Um, and there's, you know, there's times through through life when we, we have those big injuries before 
competitions and things and it means that we can't put our best foot forward for selection and, and we don't go and and that's sport at the end of the day so yeah I managed to to be with my family and support my family through a tough time. Thank you for sharing um, it's obviously a, a horrible situation but do, do you think you learned a lot about yourself during that? Absolutely um, I think I'm like I'm such an anxious person I'm someone who just worries about everything even like the smallest of things like I'm that person that leaves the house and I'm like oh have I left straighteners on or did I did I lock the door I'm that person um have I forgotten something and um I just like it definitely chilled me out a little bit because I was just like do you know what like there's more to life and you need to just sit back like relax enjoy the good times um and with rugby like just you know, if things aren't going your way, like just remind yourself that it is just a game. Um, Cause I think as professional sports people, like it's our job and we're so like, our expectations are so high of ourselves that sometimes the enjoyment goes. And actually when we play at our best is cause we're enjoying it. And I think that's something that again, like in the past I've struggled with and I just need to really focus on the enjoyment part of it and going, do you know what? There's, there's not that much, time like left in my career like um, you know as we said earlier like we've been around it for a decade and you know there's young ones coming up through through the ranks and we're kind of towards the end of our career so actually every time you step foot on the field you need to go out there and enjoy it and that's kind of one thing I think I learned through um going through that process that like rugby's a game like don't think too much about it because sometimes you can really just go within yourself if you're too worried to like try things express yourself etc um so yeah I think it's it's definitely changed me as a person I, I think it's amazing and um I don't know if mids knows it but you, you obviously earn your your corn playing but having an old hen a mother hen like yourself with those life experiences especially when you've got kind of young girls coming through 18 19 20 21 now that are full-time pros people with like that sort of life experience um, and perspective, I suppose, is invaluable. Do you, I'm not saying preach it, but do you try and share that sort of perspective with some of the younger people? Do you feel a responsibility as a senior player to to add in that way? I definitely think so. And I think that a lot of the older girls do the same um, because we've all had different experiences. So I think it's, I think it's really invaluable to share them and to kind of, show the younger girls that like it's you know if they've not been selected and they're really upset or whatever like they're just at the start of their career and there's going to be so many opportunities for them and sometimes it just feels like the end of the world um and actually just kind of having a bit of a um, perspective on things can really really help okay cool sarah what, what about you like you think about uh, throw it back to when Nolly was kicking about um, you're playing, Nolly's playing, you're playing, Nolly's playing, you know, competition for, for places, you know, what did, what did you learn in that process? As yeah, well, a, yeah. As a person and as a player. Yeah. I was always like, so lucky because um, Nolly's like a close friend of, of mine and Fleo's and she was always like the most generous person in giving advice and what to do. And she'd give, me like all the time she had to like help me improve my game and I guess you know that's just her as a person obviously she had that coaching background so she was just like an absolute wealth of knowledge and someone who played my position and like asking her for advice it would always be completely honest um and, and tell me sort of everything I need to know if I didn't know the cause or if I needed to revisit them then she was there she'd do it like, drop her hat so we didn't have that competitive element she just she really wanted me to do well I was just respected her like to the absolute utmost uh, when she was playing so I, I was really fortunate I know it's not always that way when you when you get those head-to-head -head battles and I think when me and Fleet probably first joined the squad or were in amongst um some of the EPS stuff when you sort of got on that bus to like go to training, you didn't go anywhere near the back. Like you were shouted down, like you, you know, your, your opinion didn't matter. And I think that's where um, like a lot of the senior players now think back to is that we don't want to be those people. We want to, you know, like we see that talent, those young people, yeah, like make your own mistakes. I think everyone's got to make their own mistakes. But if we're there just to sort of help them along their way and make that, this whole experience more enjoyable for them, 
then I think that's like the best that we can do. Experience is a good teacher, right? So you think like that if that's how I was treated, whether it was right or wrong or in, in humor or not, you think that's not the way forward maybe. Um, do you think, you know, with your coaching background, Sarah, you're not coaching now, are you? You did coach. No, well, sort of doing it as much as I can alongside. Do, do you think, and, and Vicky, you as a PT, getting, getting the best out of people, do you think like your your experiences there are good for you in terms of helping coach, you know, younger players and, and contributing to the team? Yeah, for me, I think I, I saw a bit of a turning point in my game when I started to coach, actually. Um, and I've realised like how to get those conversations to get like the best out of people and to get the best out of me. I think when you're playing sort of a back three position, a lot of what happens and what the ball we receive is a product of other things going on. So it's about how you can sort of have those conversations, manipulate conversations so that you can get the best out of like yourself and other people. Um, and it's, I suppose, doing it in a way where you're being positive still and reinforcing things and not overriding people, letting people still make their own decisions. Um, Cause I think you can be on the wing or at fullback, just sort of being, um, do you know what I mean, sent calls down the line like Chinese whispers, but actually how can we still have massive influence on the game? I think I got that from coaching is how can you be on the sideline and still have like influence on the game, like in the most positive fashion, which isn't being like overriding, overpowering, and just those little snippets of information feeding stuff in it is sort of how I had the transfer. What about actually coaching your sister? Does she listen to you or is it the one player that gets away with doing whatever she wants? Well, she was always really unfortunate because she was on the wing. So I was in her ear constantly. Um, I, I was From a professional point of view though, yeah? Not not as a, a sister telling her what to do. Yeah, no, both. All of it. So she well, she's not a sister. So it was, fine, it was like the only time I could like get one up on her and, and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean, not have her like going screaming to mum. It was in a rugby context, so it all got put to bed after the game. Very Sunday good. roast wasn't much fun sometimes. You know, what about you with, with your, your PT sort of um, background? Um, I was going to say, do you still PT now alongside being <laughs> – are you allowed to? Are you allowed to admit to that? Yeah, so I'm, um, like, at the moment just doing online stuff. Um, so, like, while I'm in camp in the downtime – um, I've still got a few clients that I'm working with. For me, it's been really important that I carry on doing that because obviously it's something that um, I gave up for some time um, when I got my first contract with Sevens. And to be able to just kind of get my foot back in the door, um, you know, looking to like post rugby in the next few years, um, I want to have kind of been in that sphere and, and know that I can walk into a job. Like I've got clients there and ready to go people that I've worked with for a number of years um and then I can build on that um and I just think it's one of those things that like same with coaching like if you haven't done it for a while uh like it's really hard to get back into it so just kind of just having a little bit here and there like has been really helpful and it's kept me busy as well Vicky let me help you with your marketing um you can plug your business right here I might sign up as a client actually I, I do need a little bit of help what about Away from rugby then, we're talking about ba balance and, you know, interests, hobbies. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you, Sarah, about this. MC, Sarah, DJ, Sarah McKenna. I know that's just, that's actually smoke and mirrors. But arts and crafts, puzzles, trade account and hobby craft, painting. Tell me about it. I actually love this. Um, well, I guess, I guess I've always been like pretty like creative person um and would spend like hours doing sort of artsy things like, as a kid like alongside sort of like playing rugby and like being super boisterous doing that I'd also I'm like a complete extrovert in that sense but then I love that time to myself like spending time on something um building something something like that so I've got those sort of extremes um but then I suppose it does transfer like a lot of people say I'm like a very creative player so I suppose that's how I I like have like do you know what I mean like, oh, I would love it. to have that said so, about uh, <laughs> so so yeah I just um I guess more recently it's become like cool to do crafts and and stuff like that especially like with lockdown and I just do it like in my spare time and learn lots of new crafts and a couple like new skills as I go and Fleeto came over and made Christmas wreaths with me, with me like a few years back um so I try and like 
bring it into camp, had a, a few little craft sessions with people in camp. And it's just such a great way to like have that downtime where you're not glued to a phone. Um, Cause at the end of the day, if I've been on the phone like loads, like I know it, like I can feel it. Um, it often does, you often don't feel good from it. So if you can have something that completely takes you away from that, completely to a different place in like a super wholesome way, um, then, then that's it. 100% agree. What a great role model you are. Have you have you got an example of like a favourite thing, like a go-to? So, you know, like Jackie Knoll and, and the, the men's team loves his Lego. Um, I love Lego and I hide behind a six, a five-year-old daughter. But um, have, you, have you got a favourite thing you, you go to? Uh, well, a big thing last year was felting, which is uh, balls of like wool that hasn't been like spun into uh, like, I guess, like string and then you get a needle and you stab it and it knots it so then you can make like little animals or whatever i like to make animals um and then you and you just create these little animals that are like dotted around my room and so i'd go on a plane and sounds kind of like ironic that you're stabbing things <laughs> to make cute little animals yeah um yeah exactly but you'd i'd go on the plane everyone like get laptops out and bits and pieces like that and i'd just be stabbing this this bit of wool <laughs> into my lap but hey i got i got other people onto it and they're like you know what this is genuinely like really good and so it was a it was an audi middle aisle special so <laughs> they've got some wicked arts and craft stuff brilliant um is there an insta account you've got business behind it or is it that she just a personal thing for yeah, you it's just all feel good anyone who wants to join in when when we're here it's an in, it's an in-person thing like in person in the moment I know we're trying to drag away from phones because I totally get what you're saying. When you've been on it too much, it, you, I literally feel a fog in my head. Yeah. But if you can inspire others by showing your needle stabbing yeah. thing, maybe yeah. on Instagram, um, I'll, I'll give it a look and I'll, I'll try it with my kids. Um, what about you, Vicky? Just uh, toes the bar, kipping pull-ups, um, broccoli? No, not just that. Um, I, I love food. So, yeah, just making any any food trying new recipes all that kind of stuff um and baking love all of that all about my food everyone thinks I mean, that i'm not because i'm so into the gym but i eat like a trooper i mean are we talking like do you kind of beast yourself in, in the gym and then go eat like some sort of like protein cheesecake or something like no. that or no are you proper just if you're gonna eat you you eat it's not some sort of healthy treat it's just you go no, I go all in, yeah. Um, and then I'm like, I'm a forward, I'm allowed. Yeah, 100%. I, I had a, a forwards coach, Dorian West, and I obviously had quite tight um, parameters with my, my weight because my weight went up and down. I really struggled with it. And um, I hated it, basically. So I had an England camp saying, we need you to be at this weight and your skin folds need to be here. But then I had my club coach going, have another pudding chief. He liked his forwards big and heavy. Didn't care what you looked like as long as, you know, you delivered at the weekend and he liked his scrum to be big and heavy. But, you know, that, that was hard to balance when you got your forwards coach saying have another pudding and then your other coach saying don't have pudding. Um, right, talk to me about your beauty um, routine, uh, Vicky. I'm, I'm really interested okay. to hear about it. Um, I mean, I, I've actually talked to you about this before. You, you're the one with the pineapple haircut. Yeah. Um, you know, fake tan. Yeah, I always fake tan like the day before a game. Um, just, just like I think everyone looks better with a tan, so it's just like a, a look good, feel good, play good kind of situation. Um, always have my nails painted. Sometimes they'll be a little bit chipped, but they'll always be painted. Um, I did all of last Six Nations. I had fake eyelashes. <laughs> Um, but the, the salons have been closed, so I haven't been able to get them done. Um, I just kind of like to feel girly, like as well as playing rugby. Um, and I think a lot of the girls kind of coming through, um, you're seeing a lot more of people showing that side because I think previously, like people turned their nose up at it and was like, no, you have to be a certain way. Um, you know, like if you're going to be like a brute on the pitch like you've kind of got to be that off it. And actually I think lots of people just shied away from kind of bringing their own personality and just being themselves because they wanted to show, you know, I'm really tough and strong on the pitch. Um, whereas actually I think it's really important to 
do the things that you like and, and be how you want to be um, alongside playing rugby. So yeah, I, I like dresses, I like heels, <laughs> um, I like doing my hair, makeup, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've and I'm just not- stepped into a whole different world here. I'm just nodding away going, yeah, yeah. But the, the one thing I'm picking up on, you think it's important to empower people watching you, you know, young girls that either follow you on social media because you've got big, you got a big following, um, people seeing you play on TV. You think it's important and it's a responsibility of yours to show that just just be you, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like whatever that is. And I know that in some of the camps, they've like banned fake tan. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I wouldn't be playing. <laughs> yeah, but, like, do you know what? The, the comparison in the men's game, there was coaches that wouldn't pick you unless you wore black boots. Because white boots, or I'll tell you what, to find a pair of black boots these days is impossible. You know, they're yeah, all different, they're all colour the different colours. Yeah. But at, at a certain time, you know, the traditional mindset of rugby was you conformed, and you're 100 percent right. Whether it be fake tan or boots, I got told I would never play if I played in the headgear. So at 19, I stopped playing in the headgear, and now look at these babies. <laughs> the collies, baby. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was a kid wearing white boots. You'd be like, wreck him. <laughs> when I was playing minis and I was like a winger he'd be like get him yeah he's <laughs> soft he fancies himself <laughs> it's ridiculous I, I, I just think you're right that I think the game's um, changed in that aspect I mean the fact that you can't get a pair of black boots um, but do you know what I've never apart from the Welsh players in the men's game I don't know if fake tan's a big thing um, yeah the Welsh are all for it the, the women are as well they love fake tan, don't they? The more orange, the, the boys better. And girls, eh? Yeah. <laughs> have, have you got a shade? Have you got like um? Are you, are you kind of recruiting in camp? Have you got a little color chart that you kind of sign people up to? I mean, I had to do Marley's fake tan because she was worried that she'd be streaky. Um, but yeah, I just go for the medium because it's you know then it's not too like in your face. You don't want to go Ross Geller, do you? Nah, nah, I'm not about that. But I'd yes. rather be I'd rather be orange than pale, to be fair. But um, yeah, like a few, a few people complimented my tan yesterday, so I'll take that. I would take that all day. <laughs> so Sarah, you're two years, you're a bit of a, an old wise head, you're two years senior. What's your views on fake tan? Uh, yeah, like I'm all for like look good, play good. Um, but I just, I'm probably not organised enough to do it, especially like the night before. I'm still packing my bag 10 minutes before we got to get on the bus. No, 10 minutes after we're meant to be on the bus. <laughs> yeah, we're already meant to be on the bus and I'm still packing my bag. So, no, I, I haven't got that sort of organisation skills to do my tan 24 hours beforehand. Well, what about your hair? Like, um, I actually, I was really surprised that I don't want to make it too trivial and about kind of beauty and, and hair and, and whatnot, but you've actually got to allocate time. And if someone can't braid hair in the camp, like there's a panic station, right? Like who, yeah, we used, the- have, we used to have a lady who, ke- who came in um and did our hair and she'd get there at like 7 a.m and she'd have te- like 10 minute slots for ev- like for ev- the whole squad and she'd be i don't know how like her fingers must be like cramping up at the end of it because she went through like 23 people um doing their hair she was unbelievable wasn't she Leo? she was yeah. actually from doncaster we found her in doncaster she got called um, in because me and berth weren't in the squad and we were the ones that did the hair and everyone was like panic stations the night before like who's gonna do our hair and then one time she drove down from Doncaster to Exeter and, and did everyone's hair at 7am in Doncaster. Mate, honestly, Mids needs to sign sign her up because it's the same thing. You know, when you find like a good chef, you, like we, we went, I think we played in Scotland one year, we played in Edinburgh and the food was just the next level. We stole the chef from that hotel and he came and worked for us for like two years. It was Amazing. unbelievable. This is quick fire. It's called The Greatest. It's a little game I've got. You just have to tell me what The Greatest is. I'm going to alternate between you. Sarah, I'll come to you first. The Greatest Ever Board Game and why? Mousetrap. Why? Uh, just setting it up was more fun than the game itself. 100% <laughs> agree with you. 100%. Uh, Vicky, box set to binge. Oh, um, Shit's Creek was one of my more recent ones. I loved it. And why? Um, just the characters in it. I just would laugh out loud at it. So good. Do you know what? I tried episode one and I just didn't get past it. it no, was... some pe- some people have I've I've heard that from, but I just got so into it and loved it. Sarah, 
who out of the squad would be the greatest contestant for SAS Who Dares Wins? I want to say Fleeto just because of the obviously the physical aspects, but once she, but, she's, not but, but. Of, she's not a big fan of like the cold or mud and like the dirty bits. So that's where she'd struggle. If it was just a case of like carrying an injured soul like over a marathon, like she'd be there, it'd be done before you even finish your sentence. Um, so next one in would be oh, someone like um, Zoe Allcroft. It's because she's got like an yeah. unbelievable engine. She doesn't ever complain about anything. She just gets on. She just gets on with it. And like, I reckon, she'd have like a broken arm in the game, and she wouldn't even tell anyone. She'd just keep going. She's just that kind of person. Vito, you, you're nodding. I I massively agree with Zoe Oldcroft. Yeah. I thought you were going to massively agree with yourself. Uh, I massively agree that I wouldn't like the cold or the muddy bits. Did you talk to Fish about it? Yeah, I remember watching her on it and there was part where they had to go into like a little igloo and I really don't like small spaces either. And I was like, nah, I'd be out. No, I'm not, I'm not in for that. It was unfortunate for Fisher because she always said like, obviously how cold she got because she had no yeah. air. So she yeah. was just frozen the whole time and she she's like a, a warm, like she's like a reptile, isn't she? She loves, <laughs> like, she loves warmth. She like, needs yeah. a little heat lamp on her permanently. <laughs> <laughs> right, Vicky, uh, what's the one material thing you couldn't live without? Um, fake tan. Hundred percent. We know why. You you wouldn't play if you didn't have fake tan. I know. Um, Sarah, greatest floor filler, MC, DJ Sarah McKenna. Oh, it changes all the time. At the moment, it's Samba de Janeiro. Excuse me. It's um, <laughs> we've put it on a couple of times in the South Changing Room, and it's uh, it's a nineties number. And it's like the one that goes, da, 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 you know? It's like yeah. you play at a rally during the darts. So everyone's just start like going away. And like, no, no booze in sight. It's pre-game. And you're like, this, like, it just gets everyone going. Uh, last one, Vicky, greatest take away. Probably sushi. Love sushi. Can I just say, that's not takeaway. That's, that is okay. rubbish because <laughs> takeaway, you know, Deliveroo has ruined takeaways. You know, you've got your traditional takeaways, but you can get anything now. Okay, Thai. But you can have sushi. You can have sushi if you want. <laughs> sushi or Thai. Sushi or Thai. Yeah. Okay. I'm a fish and chips, man. Until I watch Sea Spiracy or what is it called? Oh, it's terrible. I, I love fish though, but it's really sad. It's actually really sad. Genuine, when I looked at my tuna and it had the dolphin safe sticker on it, and I yeah. can't bring myself to eat They've been tuna. lying to us all this time. There's been a few people in camp who have definitely been more conscious of not eating meat. So then they went down like the pescatarian route, and then they watched that and they're like, oh. And this yeah, like, prey of salmon gets like wheeled out on the buffet, and you're like, ah. well, Honestly. it's dead now anyway. <laughs> No, but the thing is, it's like you're either eating bad fish or really bad fish as well. Can I recommend something to you? Okay. And I want to recommend it to all our viewers and listeners as well, is Racing Extinction on Prime. That will change the way you live. We're basically, we're, we're going into the sixth or fifth extinction that Earth's ever had. And it's us. Really? I don't think, I'll, that's the thing, I can't bring myself to watch these things. No, but it will make you change in a positive way, you know? But, but so we're very good already. But we're, we're, what, we're like, everyone's like, it's big industry, right? Big industry, pollution. It's not. It's cows farting. I do. I'll light my candle here. You light your candle there. And we'll, we'll find our way through the darkness. Sarah, I talked to Poppy last week about the importance of visibility. You know, O2 are doing a great job kind of sharing the content, men's, women's equally. What what do you think can be done in the game to grow the game? I think, I think like, obviously, like so much good stuff is already being done. I think where some things lack is a lot of the a lot of the women's stuff is like get to know the players, stuff like this, insight into the players. But how often do we look at the technical side of things, the technical side of the game? I think a lot of the pieces in the media at the moment are lifestyle, which is brilliant. It's great to get to know the players. Um, By I mean, the way, this is a lifestyle podcast. We're, we're getting to know you guys. <laughs> I know, but but how often do we get? How often do you get those those people like delivering like technical aspects, tactical aspects about how how the women's game was played, about you know the shape, the pans? I feel like that analysis isn't done, 
Whereas it's about, oh, like this person's first cap and it's like the nicey, nicey pieces. But I think we, that's the elements in, in reviews and, um, and like previews to games that, that is missed off. Because I had this conversation before, but if you talk, I don't know much, much about boxing, but by the time like the Fury AJ fight is like, you know, around the corner, I'm going to feel like I'm a pro. Like I know the ins and outs, do you know what I mean? Their styles, they're this, they're that, they're like their form but we don't have that like hype and i like i don't really care much about boxing but i know when that get when that when that fight comes along i'm gonna be like there for i'm gonna be like sending them all the money like get it on every screen in the house so i feel like we could really do with that hype and i get that hype from like knowing the intricacies of boxing but i feel like they don't go in we we lack that intricacies the tactical t technical element that that like to delve into that that like below the surface of, of what we're doing so that's what I that's what I'd like to see more do, of. Do, do you think that's um that's a product of professionalism though? Like you guys obviously trailblazing into that, and the better competition gets, the better head to heads you get. Like I talked to Mids about this because AP 15s he's got genuine depth now, so yeah. he's and it's getting to a point where quality players aren't going to play. Like I looked at Poppy Cleal, but like what happens when when Sarah Hunter's like back? You know not wanting to be the water girl anymore so he's got genuine competition and then you get the the same debate as you get in the men's team it's like we want sam simmons and it's like no we want billy vonapola and it's like no we want don brand all of a sudden it's going to be like we want claire we want uh, sarah hunter so do you think that's going to develop over time you know you got you got two things here you don't want to be too hypercritical and get maybe too technical because you're trying to bring yeah. more viewers uh, a new audience to the game you know to try and grow it so I think, you know, commentary, punditry, all around that is probably really uber positive. And I think it will come over time, you know, those those key head to heads, you know, people's understanding of how certain teams play. Yeah. Um, what, what about you, Vicky? You've been around the game a long time, different environments. What, what do you think can help visibility and growth of the women's game? I, I'm, I'm opposite to Sarah. Like, I genuinely think getting to know the players a little bit more, um, what makes them tick what they enjoy, um, like we've spoken about, like what, what players do outside of rugby, rugby's for everyone. And it's about um, involving everyone in it. And I just think that getting that across is really, really important. And I just don't think we do enough of that. I want to know about your future goals. Um, obviously immediate focus is retaining the Six Nations title. Um, but personally, Vicky, what, what are you, what are you working on? Obviously getting through the Six Nations and it's, with the different format, it's, you know, we can't go for that that grand slam, but we obviously want to go out there and, and win it. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, like same, obviously, um, immediate things being the Six Nations, but me and Fleo playing at club together, like, I know we really want to win the Prem. I think that'll, like, put a real, um, like, cherry on top of a, a bad cake <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, like, what this, what the past, like, couple of years have been, like, really, really tough. I think that'll be that'll be something to show that we've like really come through it and all the uh you know adversities that the previous year have provided to pull through and put in like really good performance over the next um couple of months with Saris will be massive for us so I'm really excited when the Six Nations is over is to go back to club and and do as well as we can um I guess come final time. What about the, the sort of huge impact or, or blow that New Zealand has been delayed by a year um and You've alluded to it, Vicky, um, being around the, the team for a while. There's a lot of talent snapping at your heels. Um, you know, ha has that kind of extended your sort of drive? Your Is that a massive carrot and a, a, a big old stick behind you kind of pushing you towards that? I think for a lot of us that are older, like hearing it was literally like such a shock. Um, and then when you go away and think about it, it's like, right, that gives me an opportunity to get better, um, for the team to get better. Um, and all of those things, the fact that, like Sarah just said, like the last year has been such a weird one with, with playing, not playing, all that kind of stuff. And then the fact that both of us have been injured. So we've not had like that, that easy season coming back, even though it's been like, oh, we have been able to play. Oh, we actually haven't because of injury. So it's like, we want to get game time in us and make sure that we're on top of our game and you also want the opposition to 
to feel that way as well. And, and that's what's going to bring the best games. So there's there's teams that haven't played and um, yeah, countries that, that just haven't been able to play. So the fact that it's been pushed back, it will it will be so much better for the spectators to have spectators there. Um, the games will be so much better. So yeah, like at the time it was just it was it was not easy to to hear, but um yeah, reflecting on it um actually there's so much that we can do in that time that extra year that we do have. So yeah, it's it's gonna be a long old process, but um yeah, plenty of time to 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 go out there and and give that give it our best shot. Brilliant. Sarah, what about you? Thoughts on that? Yeah, like same thing as Fleeto, we didn't get the best start to our season. So actually um, when the news came, I was like, that's that's another year to get better, like Fleeto said, and being a more experienced and older player, you're never going to be found guilty of wasting that time. Whereas I think when you're younger, you're like, oh, like another year. Like, do you know what I mean? You, you, can, you just sort of sometimes set your goals back or just be like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it. Whatever. But I think me and Fleeto would never be found guilty of that. Do you, do you guys like break that down? Are you just going along and, and playing and hoping you get a bit better, or, or like Vicky, with your sort of training ethics, have you broke that down to strength, kind of speed, skill targets? Have you both done that? Looked at yourselves from like a, a, a landscape or a bird's eye view and gone, this is where I can improve. This is what I need to do. Have you made plans for yourselves? So we we actually did talk quite a lot of, um, with the Saris lot about it at the start of the season, how we wanted our week to look. Um, but because of COVID and everything, that kind of messed it all up. So actually, the fact that it has been pushed back, maybe actually we attack pre-season ne- like as we go into next season in the way that we want. So obviously, we all have our IDPs. We have things that we need to work on and um, actually whatever our strengths are, make sure that we're still working on those as well. Um, but yeah, when it is player driven, it, you can kind of get a little bit more out as well, because it's like, it's, it's looking at, um, the extra little bits that you think you could kind of get out of your game. Um, I know a lot of us said we really want to work on our speed and, um, kind of just, it was dictated by the, the time of the week that we were able to, to train. Like it just, th- on a Thursday, like it just didn't work well um because we were like we're near the end of the week like a bit tired then you need to go into a rest day before your game so just kind of didn't work well to do speed but yeah I think um it's kind of dictated by our SNCs at, at club or with England um when you're in camp so I think we attack it kind of at the start of next season and, and go again ladies thank you for your time Vicky Sarah um good luck this weekend cheers thank you Have a good evening.